average human. So we're, <laughs> I'm going to get off now. I don't know if that, that's really very true. Okay. I just want to check. Paz, everybody, you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Oh, and that's my alarm telling me. Right, let's just answer. The, oh, great. Okay, let me just undo my alarm, which told me to wake up now so that I could talk to you in an hour. Right. Hello, Australia and Johannesburg and all these other places. Okay, I'm so excited to be here. I'm so sorry that I've kept you waiting. Um, this is not going to be as long as, well, it, it's kind of timed to about 40 minutes, which gives us really nice time to possibly have discussion around this. Um, I'm going to pick up on Jagen's work from the 1st of October, um, the whole notion of operationalizing aspects of the LCT dimensions, but I'm going to go in the opposite direction. So where he really took us into the nuts and bolts of that developing or fleshing out how you use, let's say, a particular tool or way to use it. I'm going to go in the, in the opposite direction and take the tool out into the real world for you. So um, for those of us who are familiar with the LCT tools, you know that the very first step is, I don't know who who said the word first um, it is probably Carl but I know Sharon and, and and Steve Kirk and other people have taken the notion of seeing much well uh, um, we've all written about it that first step when you are trial and erroring figuring out what's actually happening when you're looking at a knowledge practice is that moment when you see for the very first time what in fact is actually happening. Now for me, this seeing was in 2013 when I was evaluating tutors at um, a university in, in, in South Africa. And I remember just sitting there and being able to see it. I walked into one particular tutor's class at this massive South African university. And he had started right there at the bottom and he took me up with him and back down again. Now, for me, my role in higher education has now changed. And um, in the past few years, I've been involved in academic staff support and curriculum design. So there are two things that are really, really important in my work. One, it's that seeing thing to enable staff to see and then to use what they can see and the tools with which they have seen to proactively improve their curricula, their teaching. Okay, so I today am going to share with you how one particular tool has been used in this way to enable staff to see uh, and take what they've seen, uh, take what we've seen with those tools beyond just what's even happening in the classroom itself. We're going to look at how to design an entire educational experience using the epistemic play. Um, sorry, you're going to have to excuse me for a second. I'm going to put the slide on before I tell you that I'm going to be as concrete as possible. I've got to fill up my water, which I'm going to do right now. Um, I'm stealing from Mbembe here. This is a nuts and bolts, down to earth, real world kind of presentation. And while you take a look at this, I am topping up on my water. Right, we're back. Okay, so this UNESCO graphic really nicely captures the kind of complexity of the space that I've been working in um, over the years. Um, for those of you who know my work, the Russian author, most of my work is this theory practice divide. 
um, in STEM professions, but mainly in engineering. And the reason for this is that firstly, I mean, we have serious, yes, oh, there's somebody joining us, sorry. We have serious developmental challenges globally that need problem solving professionals. And secondly, that the problems that we're actually talking about are, well, increasingly complex. So the definition over here, 21st century engineering knowledge and practice requires practitioners to recognize different kinds of phenomena. Look at all those different bubbles over there, society, nature, science, technology. Each of those have fundamentally different, I shouldn't use the word fundamentally, significantly different phenomena, which when you approach them, have also significantly different approaches or significantly different possibilities in different socio-technical contexts. I mean, this is going to make more sense when I show you the next graphic where you'll actually see what it is that engineering work actually looks like. Um, what we do know from our empirical research is that, sorry, I've gone back here. What we do know is that people who successfully work in this space in the middle, and the middle is only one example. There are so many professions that, that draw on exactly the same in, in, in slightly different ways. What we do know is that to be able to work successfully in this space, you recognize those phenomena and their respectable possible approaches in a non-linear code shifting fashion. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And it's, it's iterative, it's continuous, it's kind of, it's like watching a lava lamp in the way in which people shift. You can just imagine a problem that is located in the heart of society on which draws on a particular science versus a particular science element located in an entirely different space requiring a different kind of approach to a different kind of phenomenon in a different kind of context. I might be harping on this, but you'll see that I'm, sorry, Carl, I'm in love with the epistemic plane. Okay, right. There is absolutely now. nothing wrong with being, uh, <laughs> being in love with a part of um, the LCT framework. All right. Okay. Now, here is an example of the range of work that could be described as engineering. These are what I what I actually practically did, other than the fact that they are arranged all nicely along the epistemic plane, and you can't see this yet, and that's not the intention, is that I thought all of the elements that I've seen in my graduates over the years, in the students that have uh, 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 got out into industry, in the professionals I've interviewed, what does their work look like? And I just thought this was a nice synthesis of all of the kinds of things you see people doing. And if you take a moment and just look at this picture, you will see, uh, okay, how do I even begin? All right there, they're in a meeting, they're measuring things, they're drawing things, they're working on computers, they're generating graphs, they're building, they're moving. What I was interested in is what is happening here in this person's mind. What is happening in that young student initially and then professional when they're out in the field? Because I had observed students responding to different kinds of complex problems in, in ways, one, that were not all, always the same. Um, I had observed them Sorry, you guys. Jumping up when given a complex problem and trying things on the one hand and others sitting down, making careful notes, others having this discussion with each other. And then when I observed them later in the industry, I, it's as though there was consistent, there was a consistent way of doing some things that I'd observed in the classroom and then observed in industry, but that the way in which some of them were doing things sometimes 
wasn't always appropriate in a particular environment, or it was so appropriate that they really, they kind of flew, they were promoted, they were taken on permanently. I want you to know how were they thinking and what was stimulating how they were thinking about certain things and doing things and what challenged the way in which they seemed to be working. I could never get the trial and error guys to sit down and plan and be analytical and systematic. But sometimes the trial and error guys worked, they worked, they, the way in which they worked was ideal for the problem that they were trying to solve and vice versa. Right. So the tool that was going to help me see what was going on was of course the epistemic plane. All right. The epistemic plane for those of you who are not that familiar with it is about the what and oh, how good. I'm, sorry sorry karina yes. i was just going to say thank you for uh yes for giving some introduction because i think a lot of people don't know this one this is yeah. um it's a bit of an esoteric uh part of the framework um that a friend of mine didn't actually want me to write into knowledge and knowers because he said it was a bit too esoteric but um I actually said, if it doesn't get into knowledge and knows, it's never going to be published anywhere. So yes, please do run us through what these things mean. Okay. I'd like to know. Okay. So the great thing here is the epistemic plane is about, as you can see, the what and how of a knowledge practice. Okay. What, what concept or object or process or phenomenon is the focus of a practice? What is that practice about? Okay, now the horizontal axis is about, okay, so how do we approach that what? You know, when the what we're talking about is clear to all, and I've, I've, I've explained this so often, and we haven't had an opportunity in this forum or in this space really to explore this. When the what is clear to everyone, I, I always say, it kind of announces itself. It doesn't matter what you call it. It doesn't matter. None of those things matter. You, you know it for what it is. The thing in itself has, hence the term ontic relations, is so, and Carl has used the descriptor, is bounded, that it just is what it is. And we're going to get to an, an example um, just now. Uh, I always use gravity as an example. Uh, but there are lots of other examples you could use uh, where you just know what it is, but you might not even know what the word for it is or what you do with it, but you know what it is. That is something that demonstrates stronger ontic relations for, than something that you don't know what it is that might be contested or might be um, uh, ambiguous or might need more contextualization. That's just the vertical axis. Okay. Now, when we look at, when you, when you are going to work with or look at the phenomenon that you're working, that, you, um, um, that is the, at the heart of your knowledge practice, if the way in which you do this is quite straightforward, then we talk about having stronger discursive relations. The approach, the how on the how axis is stronger than when there are multiple ways to do things or to work in relation to whatever the phenomenon or concept or process is that is at the heart of what you're talking about. So this sets up as with all the LCT uh, or many of the LCT tools, this relational plane. In other words, there are ways, there are hows, there are degrees of how in relation to degrees of what that constitute a knowledge practice. Now, we call those four relational ways um, insights. It, in other words, this plane gives us four ways of thinking, four codes. Now, for my PhD, I translated onto this plane. This is a simplified version of um, e and, uh, the interpretation device that I use. So when you are in that top right quadrant. In other words, the thing in itself is 
fundamentally there and established and clear to all and the way in which you approach it is all fixed and clear, then the knowledge practice that we're talking about is based based on established principles and associated procedures, requires what we call purest insight, okay? It's the thing that we wish most of our politicians could demonstrate when they are talking to us. In other words, if you saw them, I've just thumb sucked this for a moment, Carl, I'm thinking of you and your posts, and I'm just thinking it's exactly that. These terms are so nice because you can see them in action, okay? Purest insight is tightly bounded nuts and bolts at the heart of something essence. And the whole practice reflects that. And then if you move down to the bottom right, you'll see doctrinal insight is, it doesn't matter what the thing is that it's, that's being addressed. What's foregrounded in a particular practice is a, a method or a, a way of doing things irrespective of the phenomenon. Now, by the same token, when you shift up to the top left, it's, Okay, does it here? It's not the how you do it that matters, but the thing in itself is important, and the situation will tell you how to do it. The situation will give you or call for multiple possible approaches. And then the bottom left quadrant is I hope my, none of my serious senior people are in this session because a lot of education sits right here in the bottom left. Uh, on the left of the bottom left. In other words, demonstrating no insight. In other words, we, they don't, we don't know what the phenomenon is that at, that's at the heart of a practice. So we don't even know how to approach whatever it is because we don't know what we are. So many curricula sit down here. I'm going to get to this in a moment. Okay. That as the interpretation device or the or the or the translation device sits at the at the at the heart of um my phd and then postdoc work and what i did with this okay interlude what i noticed was that in the curriculum in which i was working in a technologist engineering classroom that the core disciplines aligned themselves, had a natural home base orientation. The core disciplines in engineering have a, what, and it's important, a home base orientation. That the physical sciences or the natural sciences at the heart of engineering require predominantly or, or, or initially certainly a great deal of purest insight. The practices around the natural sciences are like that. Mathematical sciences are predominantly or demonstrate doctrinal insight because it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the phenomenon is. It's the way in which you use the maths. And economics is very similar as well. That's really important. Although don't argue with me about the economics because I've just thrown that out there. Now on the top left, you'll see I've got the logic base up. All the technologies, all of our technologies are on the top left of our epistemic plane in the sense that the practice in which you're using or relating to a particular knowledge is about the phenomenon itself. What is it you want to do with it? How you do it is so varied. The situation will determine that. So the thought, and this is why I moved into the space, particularly with this tool, I was seeing a curriculum so strongly founded on the physical sciences and the mathematical sciences and the assumption that the logic-based sciences behaved like maths and science and they don't the logic-based sciences being all information communication technologies and other forms of technologies okay that was my first observation prior to my phd that there is a different kind of thinking that's needed here and i don't think that staff realize that to this extent and it didn't help to say to them but the kind of thinking you're using when you switch on a compu computer or you're running a machine is different from the science principle behind why the machine is running or the mathematics behind how the machine is running the technologies and the engineering science behind let's say the control system 
making that machine run in a certain way require a very different kind of thinking. And I couldn't tap into this until I found the epistemic plane. Right. So using this instrument, I then went out. I'm not going to repeat my whole PhD. I've said this a million times at different LCT events. But the heart of this is it gave me a way to look at engineering practitioner knowledge practices and actually map sequentially what, how they're thinking about what when they were solving a complex problem, sometimes even a relatively simple problem, but it, it translates to a complex problem. And this, the thing I have never said to anyone, and I said this yesterday because I trialed the whole platform, Paz, you'd be very impressed, on someone, which is why I wasn't worried this morning. Um, I've seen so many, I've seen institutions and I've seen industries ready to throw out all the mathematics and the science in favor of problem-based, project-based learning that focuses on real-world problems. And I knew that those observations of students doing things in certain ways when they were tackling a problem or a project that we given them, I knew that what was happening was we were seeing structured, structuring structures. We were seeing almost like neural pathway responses in the students that were working in certain ways that showed that they had a strong fundamental grasp, some of them, of the natural sciences or the mathematics or of these different, they were, they were enacting a deep grasp of how a kind of knowledge worked at a certain moment in a certain context. And that, I was worried about, okay, if we're just going to throw projects at everybody and not give them any like of the fundamentals, uh, it doesn't have to be in as traditional a way as it has been, because I think that's the problem. Problem is the pedagogy and not necessarily the curriculum or the knowledge. So I was concerned about people throwing the baby out with the bathwater in terms of their way in which they were approaching some of the fundamental understanding that needs to come into a modern 21st century professional technology driven educational space. So this mapping helped me clarify how, who was thinking, where were these examples of, how they, were they drawing on natural science? I had to dig obviously to get it, it's not obvious to them. For these practitioners, they didn't even know half the time that they were even talking science or talking maths or talking, well, they knew they were talking technology, but they couldn't necessarily see the nuts and bolts underneath that. So I had a tool with which I could map a whole range of practitioners solving problems. And these are just a few of the examples of what they looked like. And what I definitely had was patterns in different kinds of contexts, in different kinds of sectors. But I now also had a body of work that I could take back to the academics I was working with in the curriculum and say, okay, so if this is what complex problem solving looks like, if this is what we're aiming at enabling our students to do, how do we do this better? Um, how do we move from that siloed curriculum? How do we move from very poorly facilitated, open-ended problem solving? Here we have a set of work with which we can do this. Right. So what I'm now going to show is how we've done that. Okay. How we do take what we know that complex problem solving in this space is about code shifting, is about iterative code shifting. It's about moving from one way of thinking about a certain aspect in a moment of a problem or a situation to another. And for the really fantastic case studies I've had, you can, you can even see it in the way they speak. You can see it in the, 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 um, in the texts that they generate shows that shift in moving among the different codes. So 
I'm going to use the epistemic plane as my organizing framework because Carl wouldn't let me put another axis on that went from macro to micro. I'm joking. I've realized, Carl, retrospectively, I must just say that using it as a meta framework, as a lens through which you then shift as well, is actually far better than what I was originally trying to explain. It's a little bit of an insider thing that. Right. Just, well, I, I will just make a, a general point for everyone out of that, even if they didn't follow that sort of little bit of insider baseball, which is... Um, which is that, you know, is that, the, as we all know, well, maybe newcomers might not know that LCT is, you know, you only need as much theory as the problem demands. And the audience can handle in this case, you know, this is for an LCT audience mostly. So there's more theory than normal, but, and also what, how much time you've got. So we don't always have to use all of it. So sometimes mm -hmm. we enjoy, you know, getting into it a bit more complexly and other times it's, you can use it as a sort of a simpler, you know, in a simpler, broader fashion, um, and depending on your audience as well, not just the problem. So I think that was one of the things you just sort of kind of pointing to there and you're talking about using something as a sort of meta framework or whatever. Yes. Is that and, I'm always it, finding that I'm moving between sort of hard focused um, telephoto sort of analyses that require a lot of conceptual framework. And then I'm moving out, particularly depending on the audience, but I'm moving out to much more sort of soft focus and sort of wider often, mm. sort of mm. wide angled mm. analyses that are nowhere mm. near as nitty gritty. But what I love about LCT work is that the, however simply we put it across to people, we know that the engine room behind it is really yes. detailed and complex. And yes. that, so like for me, it's like an iPhone or a smartphone is that sometimes when it's done really, really well, it can seem really obvious and intuitive, but underneath it, inside that thing, is some seriously good hardware and software. Cool. So using this as an organizing framework, I'm now going to take you through four examples of how this instrument has been used proactively in a kind of a, instead of, you know, we're also used to, there's something happening. How do I understand this? Or there's something happening in my classroom or there's something that needs to happen in my classroom or in whatever. Um, I use the tools to explain, well, to figure out why and to possibly explain why something is happening in a certain way. Here we're starting with a whole base of research, empirical research in the field of how people really solve problems in a complex fashion uh, or complex problems. And that it is about this explicit continuous code shifting or, or scaffolded code shifting, if it's from our perspective, but they do it uh, as educators. So the starting point the, at the heart of our work as academics is the curriculum. So for me, that requires the purest insight in terms of the analogy I'm trying to make over here now. So we're going to start in the purest quadrant with curriculum. Um, and then we're going to take what we know from there and move into the situational quadrant. In other words, we're going to look at this curriculum in different possible situations or where the situation itself enables that curriculum to be enacted in a certain way. Then we're going to move down into the bottom left where it's not no insight, but now it's going to be nowhere insights and look at some of the stakeholders and knowers in the space reflected in our curriculum and look at a way of decolonizing STEM in this case. And I'm going to end up off with the mundane, horrible work that we all do as academics, um, all the admin and all that stuff. And I'm going to show you how the epistemic plan can be used to manage your academic work more effectively. So, so in each of these cases, remember, that's a starting orientation of a particular thing that we're gonna look at, but we're gonna code shift within each of those so that you understand how this actually works. Okay, let's go to curriculum. So the 
De Department of Process Engineering at Stellenbosch University is absolutely fantastic. And I've collaborated with so many wonderful colleagues there. Um, and in this case, we took this epistemic plane in a collaboration and took a look at uh, what the third and fourth year subjects actually look like. In other words, what is it that they foreground? And I think you'll understand this. For, for those of you who work in the sciences, you, you, you'll get this. I said this as an exercise. I said, well, let's look at a textbook. What does it say to you? Now, these are with people not necessarily that used to using uh, uh, LCT. Okay. And if you open up the index and you look at the well, you look at nominalizations or you look at the way in which people look at the way the index is written. Um, if you just flip through and I'm trying to kind of find a textbook that I could show this to you. If you flip through a textbook and trust me, the insight orientation will announce itself. You'll see it immediately. Okay. So when we started looking at the textbooks in these, the, in, in the third and fourth year of the program, um, the documentation written around those, the tutorial briefs, the, all of those things. Then you could see, and the reason we've done this is I'd gone in with saying, my research has shown that industry is really concerned about our graduates not being able to work on the left-hand side of this epistemic plane. In other words, towards more open-ended problem solving, towards more situational or contextually rich uh, problems as opposed to idealized on the right fixed one method problems. And so we, this particular colleague of mine, Christy Dorfling, um, has an initiative where he actually takes students out into the real world to um, um, the mines and on a whole week long kind of, um, it was originally written as a stretching the semantic wave. In other words, moving it really down into real context, uh, real minds, real work. Okay. And then he realized that, okay, let's, let's look at this with a different tool. Those same students, why is it that they can't cope in that more open-ended problem solving space? And I explained to them that if you haven't practiced code shifting, you can't just recognize, oh, I need a different kind of thinking now. Okay, I'm going to do it now. All right, I'm thinking differently now. Uh-uh. We're talking about this practice. I mean, this is pure Vygotsky in a sense as well, in terms of reaching for and trying and moving, you know. You've got to practice this. It's like a dancer, this kind of thinking. Um, and there was wonderful dancing work in LCT as well. So, that, that was the, the, the starting point of, of this external exercise um, on looking at their curriculum and what they could do about it. Now, can you imagine just being given not a whole lot of money, but some money and being told, right, Corin, you know all these wonderful things. Well, then tell us how it should be done. Here, blank slate. So what I've done over the last three years, I've actually taken all of this and worked with a whole group of multidisciplinary part-time people on designing the ideal curriculum in the ideal environment. When I say no, not, not ideal, ideal is the wrong word, a real curriculum in a real potential environment. And this call, Nathan, you will be pleased to know, is on every single document <laughs> that has gone to the government and the Council on Higher Education and to the Engineering Council. And I've had to have discussions with them about, and it's explained really, really simply, okay? But at the heart of our curriculum is the principle of epistemic code shifting, iterative epistemic code shifting that grows over time. Um, let me just find my notes on this. Okay. This kind of iterative practice is what the students in our studio engineering qualifications are going to experience every single moment, every single day, in every single subject, in every single week, in every single trimester, in every single program. It's a orchestrated, not limited, linear 
perfectly orchestrated, but an orchestrated shifting at all times around this epistemic plane to, at, you know, different degrees of complexity, different levels. You'll see what this looks like in a second. Here we go. So here, for example, is just mapping the primary graduate attribute kind of focal areas to a particular insight, okay? And th those are the numbers. So here on the left-hand side, we've got the numbers which are, indicate the graduate attributes. And in those quadrants, we've got, okay, the heart of your the lectures, there's no such thing as a lecture in our teaching environment. It's, it's, it's a slightly different experience, but has to anchor the fundamental principles. The tutorials and some of the practicals are for the immersion into and the development of the kinds of practices that require more doctrinal insight. The different kinds of more complex practicals and projects are for the stretching into the development of situational insight. In other words, this iterative move of drawing on something fundamental that comes from my purest insight and that has been practiced through doctrinal insight that I now apply in a project. So in other words, we, there's no project at the end. Our students do projects all the time in relation to the others, as well as integrated projects, okay? So, I mean, just imagine there is a major project the first year and the second year and the third year, but in each trimester, there's also a kind of a mini project. And the whole point is that it's carefully scaffolded so as to enable this iterative code shifting that we practice them in, okay? Now, we've used the tool then in all our documentation. So here you can see we've used the epistemic. This is exactly what the documentation looks like, Professor Mason. So in other words, the epistemic plane is flying around all of these official uh, well, around officialdom, they've, they've got these. So this is just a breakdown which we, we go into uh, of the kinds of the assessments that you can have and what the typical kind of focus of a particular kind of assessment is and how you can move that assessment. Into, it takes on a different nature when you approach it with a different insight, for example, okay? Um, that's just an el a continued elaboration of that where we're looking at the graduate attributes in the middle as well. And then when everybody was shoved into emergency remote teaching and we all had this big panic, um, it was, okay, what is the absolute essentials that I need to know about when I move into this online teaching space? Well, the absolute essentials are that when you are working in this top right, in other words, in what are the elements requiring the purest insight that are not negotiable? They are things like, for example, threshold concepts and enabling threshold concept discussions, uh, the linking of concepts, because that's where the whole cumulative knowledge building, you're developing purest insight through cumulative knowledge building, by the way, um, because you're developing this fundamental grasp of something, the essence of something. Um, what are, again, in emergency remote teaching from a doctrinal perspective of videos of application examples, videos of, um, for all of those poor lecturers who had to move their practicals indoors, um, it was, or oh, not indoors, <laughs> remotely indoors, hello, remotely, um, it was about, how, how do I now do this? Okay, I'm going to have to show them. I have to get, give them videos, but they can't really see the technology or the equipment. How do we do this? Okay, what's the point of those tutorials? The point of those tutorials, very often, and practicals, is to develop doctrinal insight into the procedural elements of how something is done. And so that once you're familiar with it, you can then stretch that into something else. What's happened during this period, and this is really interesting, is that a lot of the teaching work that would normally be on the bottom right, some of it has actually been shifted to the top left, in other words, to requiring more situational insight, in other words, more open-ended problems. Uh, find something in your environment that you can see out of your window, which you could describe or write or analyze, etc. Upload it to a forum. 
it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I've just realized there's another research project, sorry. Um, but but I, I, I hope you get what I'm trying to say, that this instrument has been the, the anchor in our curricular work of starting from scratch and designing what it is we need to design at a macro level. So at a program level, for people that might know some of my work, um, I run lots of workshops like this where, okay, what's the whole point of your program? What, what is it that you want to accomplish? And we use the epistemic plane. We don't, I don't give it to them first necessarily. It depends on the context. I take a very situational approach of, okay, who is it? What are we working towards? But this tool, I mean, I've watched staff, the lights go on, those wonderful epiphanous moments when they sit down with this and they go, okay, and they can actually describe their whole program like this. Or the subject, okay, what are the fundamental elements, for example, in this subject, engineering communications? What are the elements of this subject, this curriculum or the syllabus, that needs to be underpinned with purest insight? What is it? Well, please note that we've even got the word code shifting in, in our engineering communication um, subject guide. Uh, but it's a way of focusing on something very specific in relation to a particular feature and then shifting to approaching that element in your curriculum with the kind of thinking that is demonstrated by the four quadrants. So that's at program level, that's at subject level, that's at assessment waiting level. You've seen this, I want to move on. R right. So now we have this wonderful potential code shifting curriculum. Where's it going to happen? So what, probably my most exciting work is the fact that I can actually design the real environment. Now, in, during my PhD, I've now moved on. I've code shifted everybody. We're moving into the situational quadrant with me. Um, this was such an eye opener for me as part of my PhD. I remember walking into this company and other than the fact that this person had written about solving this problem in a way that was so wonderful and beautiful. Um, and I mean, I knew the student, he'd been a student of mine and was now a graduate. And he, he was the only one who had this problem solving, the only one with this beautiful circle. None of these problem solving maps are the way to do it. There is no the way to do it. This is just the way he did it. Um, but what I realized when I walked into this environment, I'm going to read it. I believe that the holistic, successful, macro to micro problem solving process undertaken by this practitioner was facilitated by the infrastructural features of the specific environmental context. Oh, Karen. And that these demonstrate a company that explicitly recognizes and realizes different forms of legitimate practices, which in turn are recognized and realized by the practitioner. This was a case of a code match. This practitioner, this technologist, so belonged in, in this space. This company worked with the World Health Organization, okay? So it's high-end kind of work. And when you walked in, you walked in here at the reception area. I'm going to go right through. And opposite that, you saw, you know, the HR manager's office and the marketing person's office and the, I don't know whatever the others were. All of them looked totally different. They were not mm, like concrete and glass cubicles at all. They definitely had a distinct identity. And I, so you could see they were, they were underpinned by kind of situational insight. Each of those areas within this particular company is significantly different. And, but opposite this area, this dedicated training area, these, this incredible space, which so clearly said science <laughs> in its signage, in, in, in just the way it was laid out, in the whole protocol about going into the venue in the first place. And then, of course, the section in which my um, um, participants, research participant worked, the maintenance section, this doctrinally sequenced, very set, ordered, 
little sequence of uh, like labs for very specific purposes. But in the middle, this open area that looked like a coffee shop, um, this kind of no, what I've labeled a Noah area. Now, these spaces in that environment were so well, and all of the sort of light blue there, that's actually glass. You could see each other. And what made sense for me was, what fell into place was the reason that this young man, well, one of the reasons he was so successful in the space, and I've subsequently seen it in many other spaces, was that the space echoes the kind of thinking valued by the company and it, and it demonstrates the, a way of thinking. In other words, code shifting is the way of thinking here. So using that as a principle, we have now designed an explicit code shifting environment. I've just got the slide up there to show you that my wonderful team, we were previously Stadio Multiversity, it's now Stadio Higher Education. And this is our integrated learning environment. You can see in my office here, by the way, I mean, the epistemic plane is everywhere. It's with me. I use it all the time. So it's on my board. So my team have absorbed this. They've never studied it formally. It's there. The epistemic plane is there. The semantic wave is there. There's a whole lot of these tools are all there. But our integrated learning environment is one in which groups of students are able to work together. That's the starting point because engineers always work in teams, whether remotely or, or, or actually physically together, they work in teams. Um, but in this environment, what you can see is we have dedicated doctrinal insight requiring stations, mechanical, electronic, and 3D printing, and a whole lot of other ones, in, in fixed spaces in this environment. There are situational insight orientated spaces, like all the areas with the whiteboards where students in fact, this is, this is repeated four times on every wall in this integrated learning environment. You have these brainstorming spaces and then you have these doctrinal spaces. And then you have the project lab and project areas that are kind of situational spaces. You have the facilitator who for all intents and purposes is meant to kind of be a purist orientated anchor of things. Um, and how you work in the space is as follows. Um, my right hand, Lauren von Breda, presented this at um, a conference last year, and this is what it looks like. Um, the nature of work that happens in that integrated learning environment shifts, both from a, from a timetable perspective as well as from a how you engage with whom. Students, well, because I've trialed this at Cape Town School of Engineering as well, we, we, we know how this works. So these are just examples, graphic examples of how students are encouraged or facilitated to develop a particular kind of insight in relation to how they're learning to do engineering. Um, I mean, the bottom right is obvious, you know, the, you know, there's safety glasses on this procedural, you can't actually see the, 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 the picture on the board, but there's, there's, a, you know, all the, the protocols are there. So these workstations, which students get up and work at while others are working on their project and yet others are listening to uh, a quiet lecture in the corner or a, there's no such thing as somebody standing talking at you for five hours. You don't learn to do engineering like that but you can have all the benefits of somebody standing talking to you for five hours in an entirely different way. And I will show you that's my big secret. Um, and still engage in ways that shift you around the epistemic plane so that you can see that there are different ways to approach some things, that there are some fundamental ways that are not negotiable. And that whole thing extends all the way to my fantastic user interface. I'm just keeping an eye on time here because you know Karen can go on. Okay, right. So this notion of supporting code shifting learning must go to the 
learner management system to the user interface. So at the moment, this is the trial that I've, this is a mock-up of, of, of what I'm developing. Um, there is no single learning platform that can actually let me do this. So I'm actually doing it myself in HTML. Aren't I fantastic? <laughs> Which has been a serious learning curve. It is important for us every single day, a student will log on and this is what they'll see. There's a progress bar at the top. When you click into this particular cell, because here's the problem. If you linearize the whole learning experience and you only, Monel, please tell me you want to sell me something. I can see somebody trying to connect to audio. Oh, Monel's switching her audio off. Sorry, sidetracked. Um, you're, you're so rigidly controlling what actually, you're, you're removing elements that can ha happen more naturalistically or happen more intuitively for students. Um, do not start me learning at a micro level and tell me, oh, I don't need to know the bigger picture, bigger reason why. I need to learn in the opposite. Okay, why are we doing this? In that sense, it's from a purist perspective of what's the fundamental principle here? Why are ah, right? Don't start me in the doctrinal quadrant. Don't start me. I want to actually be able to see that bigger picture. So see the plane. So our students will see the epistemic plane every day of their lives. Uh, you, you're going to have to ask for royalties. I mean, for lots of money, Carl. Okay, so now we're going to move. So now imagine you've got this code shift facilitating environment. Well, let's look at how you can code shift in your own teaching in relation to the different knowers in the space. Now, I was fortunate enough to, I've, uh, I've been presented this twice, um, decolonizing STEM, hidden heroes and heroines. Uh, once for Stadio with, uh, and, and my left hand, you can see I've chosen a young left hand and a young right hand to take my place when I retire in a few years time. Um, uh, and Ronaldo Rodriguez, he put together a fantastic slide here, which is why I've actually got this in and kept it for you. Um, but I was at the African Research Universities Alliance in Kenya last year as well. And I mean, the response to this was actually quite fantastic. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this epistemic plane and show you how to code shift around it in the interests of enriching students' STEM learning. But I'm going to, what on earth is this for? Ah, oh, right. Yes, gravity. Sorry, everybody. I promised you a story about gravity. So now let's start at the simple with one example and how we practice or encourage code shifting. So we all know what gravity is. Gravity is the thing that makes things fall to the, to the earth. It is the thing with such strong ontic relations in and of itself. Um, now, physics explains this as, the, this, as, as a law. I'm trying to find my notes on this because there's something important. Sorry, everyone. Uh, here we go. Okay. So it's a fundamental law with an associated formula or an, 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 a, yes, with an associated formula. Now we can develop our familiarity with this concept, let's say in terms of teaching or learning by iteratively practicing the application of this formula over and over and over in a tutorial session, if one really has to, but it's more likely that I will develop a better familiarity with it. If I stretch, if I, let's say I take that doctrinally insight, the doctrinal insight required aspect of coming to grips with gravity, that practice that I'm going to do, those endless calculations that I'm going to do, if I try them on different things. In other words, if I take those in relation to different, how gravity plays out in different situations, I'm more likely to develop a stronger grasp of this. Okay, there are multiple examples of where and why gravity is important, but I can enrich this even further. If I look at, well, okay, I know there's some hardcore people here who are going to argue with me about this, and it doesn't have to be of, we're now going to do the history of gravity. 
but you can enrich students' understanding and, and even potential love of a concept by exploring, well, where does it come from? How come it's there? To turn to semantics for a moment, which I'm going to be looking at now again, um, this is not just about using apples and simulating this and dropping this and keeping students learning down in very specific contexts or context bound, but it's about enriching. There are so many wonderful stories. It doesn't have to be apples falling on people's heads out of trees, okay? But this is a way to take a single concept. So you saw earlier the whole program fleshed out on the epistemic plane. You've seen a subject fleshed out. This is just one concept. Flesh it out. What are the features of that particular concept that you can see on the epistemic plane and then move between them? How would you move? How would you shift most appropriately among those elements, those conceptual elements to enable conceptual grasp? So now there's something I'm not going to spend time on, but I am going to say that our entire curriculum um, is every single one of the concepts and everything, how it's linked together is dependent on, uh, uh, we use semantics, not part of this talk at all, but most of you or many of you are more familiar with semantics. And we have seven fundamental science principles, which we have rewritten ourselves, which I've been obsessing about for a long time. And those principles are in every single one of our curricula. And what we do is we build them iteratively over time. Okay. So each of these principles picks up on an element and I can, I mean, I can show you what it practically looks like. It's a massive Excel spreadsheet, but it's, we constantly return to it. So that semantic motion, that cumulative learning, okay, um, um, which is built into our curricula. And we are using the blooms as for, we aren't using blooms really. I've used it on this graphic and we used it at the presentations. We're using something else <laughs> you'll see in a second but if you took the cumulative learning process that can happen across the sciences that underpin engineering practice such as the concepts behind tools and methods properties and states forces motion energy information and systems um there are key people or the concepts of key people over time in such a curriculum, okay? And Google just represents systems and everything at the top. And that cumulative learning is very comparable to code shifting. Look at how clever that is, okay? Now, this is why I'm showing you this. So when we're engaging our students in the fundamentals and we want them to grasp something. Why not shift, for example, um, I mean, we all know Einstein developed our old famous equation that describes the relationship between mass and energy and it led to the creation of the atomic bomb. Why not also tell our students about Samira Musa? Now, Samira Musa in Egypt uh, developed the equation to break the atoms of cheap metals, making the medical application of nuclear technology, such as x-rays, more accessible. Okay, it's not a competition, you guys. This is not replacement. This is a, an enrichment. All right? Uh, Isaac Newton almost needs no introduction. Okay, but every single final year student's project, the scientific method, that's also Isaac Newton. But why not also tell them about um, Ibn al Hayatham's scientific method 700 years before Newton? Okay. It's a way of enriching a student's grasp of why something has emerged and has become so useful and how it has been used in different contexts. Now, my personal favorite, Mark Zuckerberg, needs no introduction. And I mean, he built an empire based on the connectedness of people. But Jamila Abbas. Now, she's younger than most of us on this forum, saw that farmers were being, small-scale farmers were being done in, okay, because the lack of bargaining power, because they didn't have access to the latest information. She created a simple mobile phone platform to provide critical information to small-scale farmers so that they could organize themselves, 
pool their resources and actually have some kind of bargaining power in terms of the markets. Okay. These are wonderful ways to kind of enrich our students' understandings of concepts. And for me, this is a way in which to start, well, the decolonization conversation, you know, bring us into it. We are the world. We, we come in with certain ideas. This is not about challenging the ideas that are there. Well, in the recontextualization space that we're in, but this is a way to also enrich student understanding using the epistemic plane. Last but not least, how are we doing for time? Right. Very quickly. Um, the worst part of our lives. Let me see what my Fitbit tells me. Perfect. So, ironically, the first time I stretched the epistemic plane beyond um, looking at how engineers were solving problems was for a keynote that I was invited to do at a university of technology in South Africa in 2016. The heart of student protests, staff were burnt out. There were already papers uh, coming out on, on, on um, stress, depression, a whole lot of issues and confusion about, and I, I would see this with the, with the young staff that I worked with who um, were st studying for their PhDs, uh, having to teach, having to work on uh, uh, um, community engagement related uh, projects. In other words, whether they were industry stakeholders or actual community, like um, actual, they were all actual communities. I could see how m much everybody was struggling. And they'd asked me to come and speak to them because my PhD had just come out and I just, I can't remember done what. And um, I felt really sorry for all these people. And I thought, okay, let me do a really helpful workshop. Let me do a really uh, practical applied one. Let me take my problem solving epistemic plane model, Carl's epistemic plane, my five feet model, and put this to work. So I use this as a way to show them. It's again, it's an organizing tool. So this is now we're in the doctrinal quadrant. How do we practically and procedurally go about doing some of the things we do better? So, for example, in our jobs as academics, and in this case, the, the staff there, I said, okay, we tried a number of different scenarios and they gave me scenarios. All right. So, I asked them for real pedagogical problems that they were facing. And here's one. Large class, the curriculum is packed. There's not enough time to enable the kind of deep learning that you want to encourage. Students don't have the time to ask questions. And when you do make the time, they do not engage. I think everybody in this, listening to this will go, yeah, because <laughs> that always happens. Okay, let's use the epistemic plane productively. Let's put down all the elements in relation to our teaching the, 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 that, that, that not only are constituted by this problem, but that might actually represent a whole host of potential challenges we face. But in this case, okay, um, if the problem is student engagement, what I might do is go, okay, uh, the timetable is restrictive, the class size is restrictive. Very often you'll find the answer, if the problem is sitting in a particular quadrant, you'll very often find the answer in the diagonal, the opposite, okay? So here, why not use the students? Or quite frankly, one could then ask, oh, am I expecting the right thing of them at the right level? Uh, could I not integrate their better understanding of these things through student engagement by collab collaborating with a colleague? Could I give the students uh, more tutors? Is there, that would take you back into the situation. Is, uh, is there funding or into the doctrinal? Um, are there resources? In, in this case, the epistemic plane has become a thinking tool. It's a way to flesh out the features of your problem, okay? Just to enable you to look in the first place. So for the community engagement example I used at that same talk, we said, right, what is the big thing? We all have to engage with each other. But how dreadful is it that the bigger the group, 
the, the greater the number of useless emails flying around and then everybody replying to everybody, but about a part of it is very inefficient. And academics, all of us, nobody has the time to waste on this. So let's say your problem is, don't have the time, but you want to work efficiently with a whole host of stakeholders. In this case, let's say in your bottom left-hand quadrant, and the concept is efficiency. Uh, let's look at the doctrinal procedures we've got in place. What kinds of meetings? How are we running them? How are we circulating information? How are we reporting? How are we using ICTs? Because interrogating the doctrinal elements of community engagement might help us become more efficient so we can actually benefit from the whole purpose of the exercise in the first place. The last example is to using the epistemic plane, and I am glossing through this really, and I'm not going to harp on it. Every slide I'm showing you here is an, at least a half a day workshop, okay? I'm just trying to say, as an example of this tool has given so many of the people that I work with the opportunity to, to see first, to just see. The examples I've shown you beforehand of stretching this into, you know, uh, uh, imbuing the entire curriculum with a code shifting kind of underbelly, putting that, enacting that curriculum in a space that demonstrates that code shifting, pulling that into your teaching, that is all the so what, let's do something with what we know. This part is the, okay, how do I know in the first place? How do I just even begin to look? So, and the plane can be used. I'm not going to give you these examples because I'm, it's going to waste your time and not do it justice. But I have seen the lights coming on in so many of my postgraduate students, and I'm fortunate enough to work in a few kind of postgraduate cohort groups where just taking the time, in other words, there's, there's a very, very important space for, the, for doctrinal insight here. And it can free you to be able to, when in each of the things that you're looking at, you go, okay, wait a moment, what is the fundamental principle? The point of using the epistemic plane for your doctrinal work is to strengthen the ontic relations. It is to go, why am I doing this? What is the point of all of this? And which brings me to my final little anecdote. My favorite procrastinating habit is I build furniture. And I'm not a purist by any means. I'm a total situational kind of situationally oriented thinker. And what will happen is I will go, aha, here are fantastic. Oh, I can use this wood. Oh, what can I do with this? Oh, I could build shelves with this wood. What happens is that I start with a situation of what I have and I end up going down a rabbit hole, iterative rabbit hole constantly of two. Okay, let me just put this together. Then I'll measure and da, da, da. And I'll find I don't have the screws of the right length. So I'll have to make another plan. That means back up to the situational quadrant. In other words, okay, what do I have? And I end up doing that iteration so often that three hours down the line, it's a, no, 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 wait a moment, wait a moment, Karen. Purest insight time. What is the purpose? What is the phenomenon I'm addressing here? Is it about using extra wood because you have it? No, it's about a shelf for my books, which are all over the floor. So even in my personal everyday life, with my staff at work, we have our, wait, purest insight moments, we <laughs> do, where it's stop, breathe, think, strengthen the ontic relations. Wait a moment. What is the fundamental phenomenon we're addressing here? That is how powerful this fantastic tool is. That's it. We have 10 minutes to chat about this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Corinne. Um, that's, oh, look at that. It's animated. Thank you, Corinne. Um, I mean, lots of um, uh, comments in the chat. People, please just unmute yourself. Okay. I'll just say very briefly, by the way, that uh, you weren't the only person who didn't realize that um, the time ah. changed. Uh, so um, we'll send out a message to the email forum to remind everyone whenever there is a change in Sydney's time. But um, for those who arrived when? late, we will have recorded this so that people can catch up 
um, very shortly. When did you change, Carl? What date was it? It wasn't well, just me. Between... But, um... It was around October. Um... Yes, no, but we had we had Jagen on the first of October, which is why it was the fourth. Of, my... It was the fourth of October. It was just after oh, uh, Jagen. Okay, all right. <laughs> so that's our, that's, on us. Um, that's on us. That's on us. So. Um, uh, we'll let everyone know uh, just to remind them to check on their local time planner. But for those people who did arrive late, um, still, you've, you've missed a great one, but you haven't because we've recorded this. So we will be putting this onto the LCT Center's YouTube channel at some point. But in the meantime, please just jump in and unmute yourself yes. and say anything or anything or everything. Don't just let me do it. I'm just looking through the chat here that you were all chatting on. Ha! Physical geographical dispositions. Yes. I agree. Jody Martin, the online spaces, we lack the Noah space online. And the thing is, with everybody's sudden shift to, I'm just responding to some of the comments that I see here. Um, well, I can share this with you. Um, we've got a national survey on the impact of emergency remote teaching on engineering educators and on engineering postgrads. And you know what the big thing is that's come out is, Jody, I'm responding to you here, is... I appreciate it, Karen. Hi. It's the F Hi. Is the affective, is the is the um, the sense, and this is ironic. People had so many forums. You know, they've established forums, and what's happened certainly at Stellenbosch with students, if they have inquiries, they're not allowed to email lecturers directly, and you can't blame them because sometimes there are nine hundred students in a class. Okay, but they are they are sent to look at the forum, but there are millions of forums, and there is. There are so many streams on the forums. There is just, nobody can find what they want. And they have found the forum space is supposed to be the Noah space, Jody. But the forum space, I, I don't know. I'm throwing this out there. I have not seen, they end up being more doctrinal than noah -y in the sense that justifiably so. But they were meant to be the space where people can engage a replacement for the kinds of engagement you might have in a physical environment. I don't know. What does anyone else think? That's a really interesting point because I've struggled with that exactly myself. Um, most of my students were in China, which severely limits the platforms I can yeah. use, but I've seen a lot of people use, uh, colleagues use things like Padlet or whatever, which allows more of a person and character putting photos and videos and, and laying out in different ways that the online platforms just don't allow mm. the discussion formats. Mm. I'm trying to arrange I'll ask you a question, Karine. How yes. you, you go back to which image is it that you were saying that you um, have put into sort of documents to, for example, um, I'm assuming like professional associations in engineering or whoever, whomever it is that, that one has to put curriculum documents it's, to. Let me, I'm, just, I'm just trying to find it. Okay, right, let me just move you, minimize you. There we go. For some reason we're now it's, looking at your t-shirt. Oh, are you? Helen O'Grady, also Australian, by the way. Yeah, because I had to tilt it forward. I've got a massive bank of screens here, everybody. Um, I also know that you've got a lovely uh, Cartesian plane from LCT just over your shoulder. Of course, that's what I said to you. It's on my board. Any meeting, and this is a blackboard. <laughs> this is a blackboard, an old-fashioned one. One of my colleagues said he thinks that his students wouldn't even know what that was because they've never ever seen a blackboard, a real blackboard. Blackboard, whiteboard, <laughs> epistemic plane. Uh, this is the document I've used that's gone with every single, all of these. Uh, the reason I'm asking is that have you, have you found that people have uh, been able to engage with that? Or, I mean, has it made that sense one. to people? Um, I mean, I think one of the things that people were, well, is it both of those images that are you know, sharing? Uh, I've just put them, yes, but it's, you must remember it's in text and it's surrounded by text. 
So, so it starts with all the, it starts with, we know that um, industry is not happy with the technical expertise, the level of technical expertise required of engineering technicians or technologists, blah, blah, blah. And what we also know is that, and it's very simply put, and then we've used, that's the, the summary that we've got. And don't kill me, but it does say stronger phenomenon and a weaker phenomenon and a fixed, there should be plural really. Uh, no, it shouldn't. It's, that's what's in the documents. It's not stronger and weaker phenomena. It's different descriptors, but well, we've used that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, one always has to just talk to the audience. It's not about yes. theoretical purity. Which but is, I had to fly by the up way, to see them. Yeah. So I was just wondering whether they were able to, to engage with that or, I mean, one of the reasons I'm asking is that when you put up your images of, for example, the layout of an office space, mm. um, and the way in which things bring together different kinds of insights uh, for different kinds of spaces, and it's all about moving between them. I mean, which mm -hmm. I think is extremely important to sort of, you know, get that mix. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people went, ah, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And I think when one gets something so, you know, tangible um, and, you know, like, I mean, visually kind of like really clear, um, it makes a lot of sense of what can otherwise seem quite complicated technicist. I mean, in, in engineering, that won't be too bad because they are pretty knowledgey, but, um, yeah. and so they don't mind technical language but i was thinking mm. in things like the more humanities soft end mm. of social science we're always running up against people who go oh my god i can't deal with the technicality from it you know bizarrely yeah. these are often people who are immersed in incredibly technical yes post theory stroke psychoanalytic theory from uh, continental philosophy but still when they see anything that has the smacks of planes and pluses and minuses and so on mm. they go oh my gosh i'm getting an analogy this is way too technicist yes yeah. Um, so I was thinking that is a fantastic way of being able to see that image you're sharing right now, yeah. the sorts of things you're talking about. Um, yeah. um, and I think you've also captured something incredibly important to LCT, which is it's not about one, one code being best one yes. set of, I mean, like one of the things I often get asked by newcomers in say lecturers, usually in say China, for example, is which, code is the best one and i'm always saying actually it's not about one code being the best one it's about codes for roads as it were it's like which which kind of thing do you want to do what is it you want to do and then which code is best for that and in fact the more codes you are uh, good with the that's like having more languages at your disposal mm -hmm. so you actually have a lot more power and a lot more ability mm -hmm. to move around different contexts and succeed at different rules of the game as it were so i think what you're doing there is really capturing something incredibly important to lct which is it's not about which code's best it's about what's mm -hmm. good for what and mm -hmm. if you're trying to do an all-round education in something mm -hmm. then you may often need to move around the plane a lot Mm -hmm. and, and not stick in one thing or another. So, I mean, LCT is so dead against this trench warfare and this moving back and forth between this is good, no, that's good, but this is good, no, that's good. You know, doing things in person is really good. No, you know, doing it in context, no, no, doing it in a lecture hall or whatever. It's so tedious and knowing that you need to move between these is really important. I've just seen a very important and, 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 and another element is where do you start people? And I see here that mm. uh, Penny has asked, would different students come in through different quadrant, quadrants? Indeed. And I think that's the point. What I was observing before I even started uh, 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 on my PhD here was that some students just worked in some ways naturally. They have an orientation to something. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> But when they went into industry, if they were placed in the wrong place, the, 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 the other parts of them, um, there was, let's say, for example, most of our students that come in on the technician programs are situational insight people. They are people who, they are, we have an expression in Afrikaans, a boer maker plan, a farmer makes a plan. And it's, uh, 
what can I do with what I have, with what I've got? It's very much situational problem solving. Okay. Um, contextually dependent. Now those kind of people actually don't work well in highly regulated, large scale, procedurally protocoled companies, which is why they fail. A lot of these companies actually can't get the right staff because actually they don't want engineers or technicians or technologists. They want ants or robots. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with that, but declare your position. Okay. You can't pretend you want human beings and that you're interested in how they feel or how they're going to be adapt your company when actually what you want is just an entire automated system to churn out things very, very quickly. Okay. There's no judgment call here, but those are the kinds of code clashes we saw. So you'll find a student being taken on because they maybe have a can do attitude at a company, but actually the company wants highly regulated, very routinized, almost automated precision working of the workers and those people, they leave, they, they can't cope in environments like that. By the same token, you know, hardcore R and D places, which want the analytical, the, you must automatically be able to sketch and annotate and measure. And, and some of the students in the space aren't like that. They've got a feel, they're more tactile. They need to pick it up. Our job is to give everybody the best possible chance is to make sure that we put measures in place that can enable them to develop the kinds of insights that are not necessarily innate to them. In other words, develop the other, the other sides of themselves in a sense. I think Penny, that's actually what I would say, you know, um, which is hen hence the design of the environment because we don't have enough time to explicitly do all of this. And one, you, you, you deny students agency entirely if you're going to dictate all of it. By creating a space like we are, where in fact you're signposting kinds of insight requirements in different kinds of spaces in the environment itself, but students are also able to vicariously experience the benefits of certain insights through their classmates or their peers working on, in other words, it becomes a whole lived experience. That's, I think, what's happening. In other words, you are observing code shifting. You are in, my staff work like this, even though I have taught them and we worked with the epistemic plane, but it's become natural. We have spaces where we do certain kinds of things where even my tone of voice changes because we move down to the bottom left quadrant to go and have a cigarette. <laughs> Joking. I'm just saying that, that it becomes almost like a way of life. People are going to say, I sound like a, what do I sound like? I sound like a convert. <laughs> I love the epistemic plane. Okay, everyone, any other questions or any other feedback? I'm quite yes, happy I should, to. I should be yes? doing my uh, thing of bringing it to a close soon, but yes, go for it. Go for it. Karen? Somebody else? Yes. Hello, hi, Nicholas. Nick West Hello. from... Yes, how are you doing? Hello, Nick. I'm doing very well, thank good, you. Good, good. Good, good. Um, it's, it, your talk reminded me of something quite that has bothered me over the years. And uh, um, engineering is one of those disciplines that is incredibly linked to society. And very often we have to deal with people and understand people and talk to people. And it's always amused me how, in many cases, all the social um, responsibility courses uh, end up in the final year. Yes. And uh, rather than woven in, in a way, um, throughout the years. And that's exactly what you're describing. Effectively, the times we're spending far too much time, uh, I suppose, on the um, situational purists and doctrinal, in a way. Um, and not so much time actually yes. in a in a Nova code and um, yeah. allowing engineers to, in a way, it's an, it's a, it's a it's a double whammy because, in a way, engineers I think are uh, intuitively inclined to these aspects, but they are not those aspects are not cultivated mm. um, throughout the the curriculum. Uh, and then I think yeah. it's. Hmm? 
Come again? They're not valued. They're not valued in the classroom. Yes, at not, all. not legitimated at all. Certain, exactly, and they're not legitimated because of our assessment practices. We are assessing Absolutely. on the right hand side because it's easier, it's quicker, it's faster because there's one answer and there's one thing Absolutely. we're addressing. Uh, no disrespect not to my just, colleagues, that, and all of them are mm -hmm. trying to shift in their ways left. Sorry, Nick, to interrupt you, but yes, carry on. As I said, it's, uh, it's, I mean, going through engineering, everyone speaks about the, uh, the arty farty stuff, you know. But actually, if you, the joke is, if you actually speak to many engineers, they are actually quite arty farty themselves by, by definition, mm -hmm. and that's what an engineer mm -hmm. does. And it's such mm -hmm. a shame, as I said, that it's not actually woven in. And uh, so, uh, thank you. It is, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very good point. Cool. cool. I like the fact that the thing about, you said that people are arty farty. Sorry, I'm trying to find my other rest of my screen. Um, all the engineers that I know, it's music and art yep. and uh, very interesting philosophy. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Anyone else? Yes. Sorry, who's chatting to me? I'm taking screenshots here. Okay, I think um, I think we uh, uh, have uh, exceeded our time. Yes. Um, so what I'm going to do is to uh, say thank you very much, Kareem, and I'm glad you made it. And um, we've now sent out an email to everyone reminding them to check uh, the times and and also. Uh, I managed to get the date wrong on that email. So, uh, yes, that's quite ironic. When you look in the emails, you'll see what I'm talking about. But um, thank you so much. What we're going to do is we've recorded this, and if it's okay cool. with you, we'll um, mm. upload this to the LCT Centre's YouTube channel when we've got a moment uh, in the not-too-distant future um, so that those who arrive late can um, uh, um, come and see how much... Uh, I'm being attacked by a dog. <gasps> can uh, come exactly. and see... Um, uh, how innovative uh, and, uh, and really amazing some of this stuff is in terms of things like uh, learning spaces and so on. There was so much in that talk that I know that people were able to take in all sorts of directions. Um, just as one example, at uh, one point Jack Walton said, oh, this is uh, really important for music. So engineering, music, you know, online teaching, remote teaching. So there's loads there. But I'm just... Jack <laughs> and I... I was just going to say, Jack and I are already collaborating because we knew that there is wonderful space here. And sorry, Jack, we'll catch up before yours. We have well, a lovely... Fantastic. So thank you so much to everybody for coming along and uh, very much hope to see you in two weeks' time. And uh, as will be Vincent. Cool. What do you say, Vincent? Oh, hello, Vincent. Hello, Vincent. <laughs> one, of the, one of the dogs of LCT. And um, uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Cool. And I hope to see you all in two weeks' time. Thank you again, Corinne. Awesome. And thank you for thank being you able to so do much, it. Thank you so much, everyone. So quickly cool. after waking up. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes. Right. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have an awesome week. <laughs> oh dear thank you Corinne, for managing to do that um did you get text messages from me i don't know if your message your mobile has changed or not my mobile is here i've got about 20 million text messages from you my phone was on silent and so, when i saw only the two i think one, i only sent I two I, I sent several I, I rang up several times as well and i was think, wondering whether you were i didn't have your landline so um I don't have a landline anymore. Oh, and my phone oh. wasn't silent. I cannot believe this. Right. Big it was going straight, actually. It was said that you were busy, so I wasn't able to get in touch with you to say, wake up. And then I saw another number, and I phoned it, and it was Lee Rusniak. Thank you. Yes, he said, Lee, Lee Rusniak. I said, so oh, my much. God, do not tell me. Do not tell me. She said, no. So I said, oh, I've got it as 8 o'clock. My alarm is set. And yeah, everything. well, we learn, we learn, we, yeah, um, we, have uh, so we do time. have a thing in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the signature saying, please check your local time here. But I don't, I mean, uh, I don't think anybody realized that we'd moved. So uh, it's, up to, it's on us uh, that we, we didn't tell but, everybody we should have done. So we will do in yeah, future. But also I'm now, I'm going to change all the others because I would have, like some others, signed up at eight o'clock our time. And it have been an hour in for next time. Who's on next? Is yeah. it?
It's Lee. Who is Lee. It's Lee. Yes. Right. It's Lee. It's Lee. Um, Lee, I promise I won't be late for yours. So, right. well, I mean, what we'll do is, I think what we'll do is normally we wait until after, uh, normally we wait until after the end of, um, uh, uh, Paz, can you cut the recording? We really don't need all this yeah. at the end of it for the YouTube, YouTube channel. Um, 